Thanks. Um, so if anyone has questions, just go ahead and save them or just like raise your hand in the middle of the thing. There's no need to wait till the end because it's pretty, pretty casual. If you have questions now, that's fine. I mean. um, but so we're going to talk about core data performance. So this is what core data looks like in a lot of applications. Um, this is why people abandon core data. They say we need to use something else because it's a huge problem. But really what happened here is that uh, in the name of performance, they made things way more complicated than necessary, and now they just have this big mess that they have to maintain, and I don't, I don't really want to do that. So there was a time where we were developing for this thing, and then performance was super critical. Like in the last talk, you saw how uh, you know, turning off transparency made a little bit of difference, slightly faster frame rate drawing. On this thing, the 3GS, turning off transparency was a difference in like 20 frames per second. It was a huge difference. Um, we would also do like weird optimizations where you, instead of having sub views in your table view rows, just have everything in one view that you manually draw with draw rect, because that was a lot faster. Now you can get away with having like 15 views in your cells and no one cares. But so we're not building for this anymore, right? We have faster devices. There was a time where you needed to do like streaming JSON parsing or XML parsing because we didn't have enough RAM to keep the response in memory all at once. Uh, like none of that crap is necessary. This is my friend's application that we, he made back during iOS 4 or so. Uh, here, he had to do every trick in the book possible because Penbook is an app written for the, the service Penboard. Have you ever heard of Penboard? A few of you. It's not very popular, I guess. But so you could store bookmarks and instead of having them on your computer and then eventually we got bookmark syncing in browsers, this would just be some service that stored all your bookmarks. But the API for this service was A, an XML, and B, would return all of your bookmarks all at once. And there was no way to say, only give me what changed, or only give me the ones after this. And so he had customers that had 60,000, 100,000 bookmarks. Uh, so to get that to work on old devices and make that not just the slowest, terriblest thing ever, he had to do streaming JSON part or streaming XML parsing, uh, every core data trick you've ever heard of, every drawing trick you've ever heard of, and even then it still took, I think like 15 seconds or so to handle 100,000 bookmarks. Um, but at least it could do it in a way that did not block scrolling and things were working. Um, even after he stopped developing this, there are other apps, and if you go look at articles talking about these newer apps, they compare the speed and performance of his app to theirs, even though his isn't around anymore. Um, but this is, most of those tricks are not necessary anymore. We have better devices. So I made some like arbitrary program so we could talk about some of this. Um, here I have an office, I have conference rooms, and so uh, we need an app for all of our employees to say which conference room is reserved so I can schedule my meeting. And initially our office is not very big, we just have the one, the one room. So we can just do like the simplest thing possible for this and not need to worry too much about any sort of complications. Like we can just use one context on the main thread and just do all our work there and it's not really a big deal. This is the reason, we have the same icons, that was good. Um, so this is the reason why we should make things complicated because we specifically measured our app, specifically saw where it was slow, and then decided to make it faster. So in our arbitrary example, you can see here that we, it doesn't take that much time to, to process the one room with the one employee on you know, the main thread even, like whatever. If that's all we're doing the one time, we're done. When we reload that list, because now we have duplicate information and we have to deduplicate that and not just have a list that grows, then it's even less time because the unique constraints in core data are pretty good. And we attempt to save the thing and it says, no, that's already there, so we're fine. If we had a thousand rooms, it starts to be more expensive. And now we get into something that maybe we should, we should be looking at, we should probably uh, care about this. When we refresh a thousand rooms, it's even more of a problem because then you have a thousand duplicate items that you have to deduplicate and keep up with changes for. So now that's 2.3 seconds where a bunch of that is time that the main thread is totally blocked. 
if we have 5,000 rooms, now we have like a huge problem. And if we don't do anything about it, 14 and a half seconds is almost long enough for the watchdog process on your device to kill your app because it's non-responsive. So now here we need to do some things and make core data like slightly more complicated in order to make things not quite so terrible. <clears throat> if we move the, the processing of our data into the background, into a background context, suddenly things are not so terrible anymore. We take, we take time still, but it's time spent on some other thread. This is some other thread. This one up here is the main thread. Not that much time actually spent on the main thread. We're down to half a second compared to 14 and a half seconds. If we look down in the uh, list of profiling things that you see there, <laughs> okay, um, we can see that most of the time is spent on this merging changes from the context notification because we just updated basically 5,000 items when we hit refresh. And so now the main context has to refresh its references to 5,000 items to say, oh, everything has changed. If we change it, instead of saving all 5,000 changes all at once when we're processing our JSON and just process like 100 at a time and then save, now each of those change sets to merge to the main thread are a little bit smaller. So the work takes a little bit longer overall, but we spread it out some. We're not using the CPU all the time. We could even impose an artificial delay and give even more time in between each batch save. So the process would take a while, but at least now the phone is totally responsive while this is happening. I tried this to make it faster and it didn't actually work. This is why you wanna measure things and not just guess. I figured since we know that when we're downloading this list again, we're getting the same items again. So let's just delete everything that's there and then get the new items. And maybe that's faster because then you don't have to deal with the uniquing. Um, so on the left is what we had before. On the right is what happens when you say, let's delete everything and then do it. We spend, even though the processing is technically happening in the background, now we have to process the change of all the items were removed and then all the items were added back. So my background processing still spends like almost half of its time on the main thread just reconciling those changes back to that main thread context. So this was actually a, a terrible idea. More realistically, what you would do if you're at a company where you're developing the thing and you know the API people, how many of you like directly control the API that you're working with? Like you personally could go and make changes to it, right? How many of you are at least like not enemies with the people that do maintain it? <laughs> so you could ask them nicely to make some changes to it? Yeah, so like in this situation, Downloading 5,000 things when we already have those 5,000 things is redundant and silly, right? If all of that information is exactly the same, we're wasting data and we're wasting all this CPU effort. So here's what happens if we, if we go back to the API and say, what if you only give us the 100 rooms that changed since the last time we requested this instead of all 5,000 rooms every time? And now we're back down to using 25 milliseconds on the main thread so we can go worry about something else now. Like technically that makes you skip what? One frame we saw from before? So there's a ton of information about this stuff. Every WWDC, there's a video. Everyone knows what WWDC is, by the way, right? So Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference, it's basically impossible to go anymore. Um, but every year they put out the videos. Every year they talk about the things that have changed in core data because there's a bunch of things that did not exist back during iOS 3, iOS 4, iOS 5 that do exist now to make a lot of these things a lot easier to do. Um, so every year there's a talk about what they've changed. Often there's a talk about specific performance things that you can do to make it better. Um, instruments specifically has a user guide, which is up to date, because one of the problems with instruments is even if you did figure it out, I don't know, a year or two ago, the UI changes every release a little bit and things move around and you have to find where things are. This guide is kept up to date pretty closely, so you're probably gonna find what you're looking for there. And it is fairly extensive. It's not like some documentation where there's this much information about the thing. Like this is a, a multi-page guide that's almost as long as the human interface guidelines. Um, and when these slides are on the, the thing, you'll be able to actually see the links that these are pointing to. Um, there's also specifically talks and video explaining how to use the time profiler 
and, and work out all this performance stuff. Like, it is sort of a complicated thing, but Apple puts a lot of effort into making sure that you have the information necessary to do it. And uh, yeah, so that's my time. If anyone has questions or something. Cool. I guess we can all uh, go back to beer. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have not specifically done them because most of my work. Yeah, well, so Realm has similar issues, right? Where like uh, objects from your your Realm context thing cannot be used across threads, and, and so you need to yeah. you know worry about multi-threading and stuff. Sure. I mean, you could do that with core data as well, right? You don't necessarily have to use manage objects all over your code. You could easily convert them into a struct and just use the struct in places. Unless you need to make changes to the object, then that would be totally fine. Since we're here, man, do you want to use any third party libraries? On top of core data? Uh, or instead? Oh, instead of core data? Um, if it's my own project, I would probably use core data before I use anything else, unless I had some like very specific reason not to. Um, core data has been around for a long time, has had a lot of engineers, a lot of very smart engineers working on it, and a lot of work done to it. Realm has been around for a couple years. Whatever new library you just heard about has been out for like six months. Um, there's a lot more time and effort put into making sure this works compared to any of any other solution. <coughs> So, I mean, there are some cases where maybe they do something especially nice and you want to use that for a specific reason, but for most apps, I would use this. Can you give any specific advice on uh, like synchronizing core data with cloud kit, like all those bulk operations and uh, from which threads to put them and uh, how to deal with the synchronization? Yeah, so like with multi-threading in general, the simplest implementation is probably the best one, right? The more complicated you make it, the worse it gets. Um, like I would just try to have just your main thread where you're doing your UI stuff, right? And maybe one other background queue or background thread or something that you're trying to do work on. Like unless you specifically have performance problems and you need to do something more elaborate, like just the simplest possible implementation so that when you're looking at it, you can tell what's going on. So basically, if for synchronization with CloudKit, is it, mm. is it uh, recommended to use uh, those child contexts on different threads or like, how to deal with Yeah, well, so, so now we have that persistent container or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you can just say, I have some stuff I want to do in the background, and it will take care of making a context that's appropriate for that and doing the things on that context. Um, so it's, yeah, it's even simpler to just do arbitrary stuff in the background. But even then, like, unless you need to, if, if your CloudKit is syncing one object back and forth or something, or minimal amounts of changes, then like, does it need to be done in the background at all? Yeah? So, um, we're working a lot with Nubitel, right? It's a short task, so for the core, they are busy, they are not busy, right? Right, right. What is your experience with um, Nubitel and what's it called? Threat safety. Threat safety? Threat safety. Yeah, so with core data context, the objects that you get out of a context, these NS managed objects, should not pass thread boundaries, right? Yeah. Um, the ones that you get from your main context should be used on your main thread. The ones you get from somewhere else should only be used somewhere else. You can pass the object ID across threads. So you could say, uh, my main thread, I selected a bunch of things in a list and I want to do some batch operation on these 10 items. Excuse me. So you could say, uh, do this work on these 10 object IDs. And then in the background, you could look it up, make the changes, and then those changes will come back. Yeah. Can you shed some light on uh, what is the most performant core data setup? Uh, well, the most performant core data setup heavily depends on exactly what you're doing. Um, just like because core data is technically not a database, and you get in trouble if you think of it like a database, but with, with data storage in general, it matters how you intend to use it, and that should decide things like how you store it. 
because it could be that your performance issue is just that you are fetching a single item 10,000 times and you need to fetch one, one time and fetch the 10,000 items all at once. And that's the performance difference. It could be that you maybe need another, an, an additional context because you need to do background work. It could be that you need to do some prefetching before then you do some operations. It could mean that you need to use some of these batch operations. So uh, like a classic problem from before, there's this article that uh, Brent Simmons wrote where he chose not to use core data for his RSS reader application because you have this operation of there's 10,000 articles and you want to mark all of them as read. And before, you would have to fetch each individual thing and change the property on each one and then save all those changes back. Like now we have a batch update operation where you could just say, all articles, make this property true, done. Um, like, uh, yeah, I would just start with the simplest possible implementation. Just do everything on one context and then when you see that that's not working, find out exactly why it's not working and that's what needs to be improved. There's no one solution that's gonna work for everybody. Yeah? Are there, um, do you use any third party Um, some projects I make some convenience methods. Sometimes it's, it's handy. Sometimes it seems like more work than necessary. Like you're not actually saving that much. Um, like I've worked on projects that use some wrappers on top of core data that were supposed to make things more convenient, but in, in a lot of cases that just made it harder to figure out what was happening so that you could fix it when there was a performance issue or like simplify it when it needed to be simplified. Um, like core data itself is already an abstraction over a number of things, right? There's SQLite and there's an object cache and there's all this stuff about object relationships. Like that's already abstractions on top of things. So more abstractions on top of that, probably not necessary. So you always recommend using the managed object context in Bedrock too? Uh, no, like if, if you're doing minimal changes and you're, you're updating one object and changing like one property, then just do that in the main context. Like the simplest possible case is the best. You'll probably end up needing at least one other context because you're you know, handling more than just one single property. But until it turns out that there's actually a performance problem, the simplest possible case is the best. If you have core data, is there something about core data you dislike that you wish Apple <laughs> would fix? Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, so specifically in Swift, right? Like we've improved something so that like our, your fetch requests are generic. So bef like originally in Swift, you had to make a fetch request and then typecast it to an array of the results you expected because it had no idea of knowing what type you wanted. Where now we have generic fetch requests so that you can actually do that. So that's much better. But the thing that annoys me still is um, the properties that you store in core data in your managed object model are very Objective-C based. So if you want to store a number, for example, it's, it's going to store it as an NS number and expects like an N32 or an N16 or something. Um, like it'd be nice if you could get a property that was just a Swift int instead of an NS number that you didn't have to do stuff with. Is there something you don't have with the next version? Probably. I mean, they've already made these improvements so far to make things much nicer to do in Swift with core data. Um, there's probably a whole lot of debate about exactly how to do it or exactly what the API should be. There's also an issue with um, if you have required properties on your entity, then they're still generated as optional properties in, in the, the Swift file. But then I just go and edit the file and delete the uh, question mark. And then it works fine. Yeah? No more questions? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks.